Hey everybody and welcome to XSTEM All Access. My name is Justin Schaefer, also known as Mr. Fascinate, and I'll be your host for this multi-day series showcasing some of the coolest minds in STEM. Today is the final day of inspiring new XSTEM episodes brought to you by the USA Science and Engineering Festival. But don't worry if you've missed an episode, you can watch the entire series on demand at usasciencefestival.org. The mission of the USA in Science and Engineering Festival is to inspire the next generation about careers in STEM. You can check out their other free programs and events for teachers and students at usasciencefestival.org. Before we begin, please join me in thanking our partners, AstraZeneca, Discovery Channel, and the U.S. Space Force for making this XSTEM series possible. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Justin Schaefer, also known as Mr. Fascinate, and I've spoken to young people all over the world about the prospect of science and technology. I've also hosted science TV shows with Travel Channel, WGBH, and folks like Al Roker. I have a fun time engaging young people with STEM careers, and I'm excited to be hosting this series and continue to engage with you all on a regular basis on social media. I hope you're excited as I am to get started because today's topic is returning to the moon and we have two speakers joining us from NASA. I know I'm absolutely excited because I'm clearly dressed for the occasion here. So let's get ready to hear their personal stories and learn more about NASA's Artemis mission to return astronauts to the moon, a mission preparing the way for human missions to Mars. First, we'll hear from NASA astronaut Zena Cardman. Later in the program, we'll hear from NASA planetary protection engineer, Mujige Cooper. And in between, we'll rock out to some space exploration inspired tunes from our friend Roy Moy III from STEM Music. You're not going to want to miss a single minute of this. Wherever you're tuning in from today, make sure you show us how you STEM on social media. Get your parents' permission and share a video or photo of you doing your favorite science activities. Grab your phone and take a selfie while tuning in today. Teachers, show us what your students are doing in the classroom and tag USA Science Fest and me at Mr. Fascinate and use the hashtag show us how you STEM. Speaking of selfies, there will be an opportunity for a virtual selfie with me later in the program. I'm so excited to have you all and have your cameras on standby because that virtual selfie is gonna be super cool. Now let's get started. I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, NASA astronaut, Zena Cardman. Zena is a marine scientist turned astronaut who is taking her passion for science from the deep sea into outer space. She was selected by NASA to join the 2017 astronaut candidate class, and after completing the initial astronaut candidate training, is now eligible for a mission assignment. Zena holds a bachelor's of science in biology and a master's of science in marine sciences from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. As a marine scientist, her research focused primarily on microorganisms and subsurface environments, ranging from caves, to deep sea sediments. She has also participated in multiple Antarctic expeditions. Zena, I'm so excited to meet you and welcome to XSTEM. Hey, Justin, thank you so much for having me. It's great to meet you too and to meet a fellow marine scientist I hear. I'm just really happy to be sharing with you a little bit about my background, what it's like to train as a NASA astronaut and where we're going as astronauts these days working with NASA. Sounds great. Looking forward to hearing you rock the house. Awesome. Yeah, well, uh, like you said, my name is Zena. I'm actually a member of the newest class of NASA astronauts, although we're getting ready to hire a brand new class. So be sure to stay tuned for uh, seeing who those folks will be. Um, but my background, uh, like you said, is a marine scientist, microbiologist and biochemist. There's no single path really to becoming an astronaut, but that's the route that I chose. I spent a lot of my time working in uh, very far away remote places like the Arctic or Antarctica, uh, working as part of a really large research group there. I also later spent a lot of time exploring similar microorganisms, but underground in caves and in deep sea sediments. Uh, so I really like to get uh, uncomfortable, dirty, uh, you know, really getting out there in the environment for my research. 
Um, but also one of the things that I loved most uh, about my time doing field work and field science was getting to know these big groups of people and, you know, not just scientists, but also the engineers, the cooks, the electricians, people who really make it all come together and are part of this, this big team making the science happen. And so that kind of teamwork aspect and operational side of it is one of the one of the biggest reasons really that I applied to be a NASA astronaut. I started applying in 2015, in December of 2015. The application process takes a long time, but I was so happy to be selected. I felt incredibly lucky to be part of this really diverse set of people who are in the 2017 class. We're called the Turtles. Um, we spend the two, uh, two or two and a half first years of our training uh, really just doing basic training across the board. Um, so this is everything from, uh, you know, learning the systems of the International Space Station where we'll be flying. Uh, to learning emergency procedures. So on the next photo, you'll see some of the uh, emergency procedure training for what happens if something goes wrong on the space station. And so we know exactly how to handle that. We also train in robotics, how to operate this really big uh, robotic arm to capture vehicles or drive friends around who are doing spacewalks outside the station. We learn how to fly jets. We have a supersonic jet called the T-38 and we get to train in this really high paced, high stakes environment and how to you know, operate uh, under these circumstances. We also use these jets as a way to train for maintenance and repair. Um, one of the most important skills as an astronaut is to be able to fix things. And that's because when you're in space, nobody can really uh, come and help you repair it. So you really have to be not only the astronaut, but also the, the handyman on, on orbit, um, whether that thing that breaks is the toilet, <laughs> as it often does. Um, we have this really unique toilet in space um, or whether the thing that's broken is something outside of the space station. And so we have to do a, a spacewalk to repair or install new equipment. And actually, that spacewalk training is is one of the biggest parts of training to be an astronaut. Um, and it's a, a hard thing to train for on Earth. Obviously, you're not weightless on Earth like you would be in space. But we do have these incredible training suits uh, and they're very much like the spacesuits that we use in orbit. And we have a giant facility called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, which is just an enormous swimming pool. And inside the swimming pool, it has a full mock-up of the International Space Station. And so you get suited up. Uh, it takes a lot of help here on Earth since you weigh closer to 300 or 350 pounds in this spacesuit. Uh, but then you get underwater and you're effectively weightless, just like we will be in orbit. And so we get this awesome, hands-on, really cool physical training for how to conduct these spacewalks, how to do repairs outside of the space station. Um, and, you know, it's not just repairs that we do outside of the space station. We also get to help work on scientific experiments. So this is one that we did a spacewalk on uh, about two years ago now called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. And it's this absolutely awesome physics experiment on the exterior of the International Space Station. I think probably the most important thing that we do in space is work on things for Earth. And that includes a lot of science uh, and development of technologies and research that we can only do there because it's such a unique platform. Um, so we do things in space like uh, take observations of the Earth. We're really, you know, Earth scientists, meteorologists, climatologists. We can take observations of things like hurricanes from orbit. We can observe lightning strikes and take photos of how that changes through time. We can track wildfires in the American West. We are often the first ones to see volcanoes erupting and, and grab photos of those. And these photos become really awesome data sets for scientists on Earth who are tracking changes through time. We also grow food in space. Uh, you know, this is a really happy thing for us as astronauts, but it's actually obviously incredibly important as we're looking to go further and further to places like Mars and spending longer in space as humans. We're, we're pretty good at working and operating in low Earth orbit, but we don't know yet really how to work uh, for longer and longer periods of time. So one of those things will mean growing a lot of our own food. And this, of course, helps people on Earth as well, uh, doing things like hydroponic 
uh, growth of lettuces and really high nutrient rich things that helps agriculture here on earth as well. Uh, and even our water reclamation systems are absolutely amazing. We have this super cool, robust system for recycling water that's 80 to 85% effective at recycling all the water that we use. Um, we also do microbiology research. We do cell biology research, things that uh, help us better understand um, human growth and our own genetics. Um, we can actually 3D print organs in outer space, which is just absolutely awesome for, for research here on Earth. Um, and it's just, it's a great laboratory. It's actually an international laboratory uh, in space with this, this awesome facility. Um, but one of my favorite things to do also is, is actually geology training. And so, of course, this is near and dear to my heart since I did a lot of geology and geobiology field work uh, as an undergrad, as a graduate student. And it's something that we have to learn as astronauts, whether you came in as a field scientist like myself or whether you were a test pilot or an engineer. Uh, for your background. Um, the reason that we're doing all of this uh, geology training and field training is because we are getting ready to go to the moon. Um, the moon is a really challenging place to go, uh, and we haven't been in more than half a century now. So we're really having to plan for this, this awesome challenge that is getting back to the moon uh, in my career. And I, I'm really, I'm so excited to be part of NASA when we go there. The moon is such an interesting place as, you know, even a biologist, we're not obviously expecting to find microorganisms on the moon, but the moon uh, really is kind of like this time capsule for what happened on Earth. Unlike Earth, there are no microorganisms or water weathering um, that, you know, interrupt this time capsule of uh, all of the things that were going on on Earth four billion years ago. Uh, and so one of the things we get to do as astronauts is help develop the tools that we're going to use to collect samples on the moon. And how do we do that in a, a really pristine way so that we actually know what we're looking at when we bring these rocks home? Uh, so you can see some of my classmates having fun with the uh, tools that we're developing for our next lunar missions. Um, we also get to develop the new spacesuits that we'll be using on the moon. This is a really, really fun part of the job, but also absolutely critical for these new missions. Uh, the spacesuits that we use on the International Space Station are amazing, but they don't work so well when you have to walk uh, using your feet. Um, spacewalking, as we know it, is actually more like climbing around on a jungle gym with your arms. Um, but when we go to the moon and we need to be walking around and collecting samples, the mobility that you need uh, is so different than, than what we're used to. So it's been absolutely awesome being part of those tests. Um, so these missions to go to the moon are called Artemis, and I'm just absolutely so proud to be in the astronaut corps when we're getting ready for these Artemis missions. Artemis is preparing to send the first woman to the moon, and I can't wait to see where some of my classmates, some of my colleagues wind up in the next couple of years, and hoping that some of you watching are inspired to join us in our, our journeys here at NASA. So I'm really looking forward to hearing some questions and talking to you a little bit more, Justin. Zena, that was fantastic. I think we're all super inspired and excited for your future as well over here. Uh, so curious, I want to hear about NASA's astronaut training and, you know, what is your favorite part about the training and how you prepare for that? Yeah, I think one of my favorite parts of the training is how different every day is. It feels a lot like being in school, actually. Um, so, you know, one hour you might be flying in the T-38 um, and learning aviation, and the next hour you might be taking a Russian language lesson. It's an international space station, and so learning how to speak the language of the people who will be in space with you is really important. Um, I love learning engineering systems, life support systems, systems, and then also, of course, learning how to do all of the science that we'll do on board the station. Gotcha. And so you had an interesting path, right? Because you started off in marine science, which most people wouldn't immediately say is directly related to space science or a job at NASA. So what inspired you to kind of make that career pivot and, and start to work at NASA? 
Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think if you look at the folks who joined me in my class or in other recent classes, um, everyone comes from really different backgrounds. Some people were in the military as service members, pilots, aviators. Um, some people were engineers. Um, we have uh, one of my classmates was on a nuclear submarine. Uh, and then people like me who are geologists or microbiologists, there's no single one path. But the one thing that we all have in common is a love for working in teams. Um, and I think it's really that that teamwork aspect and the operational aspect of the science that I was doing in the field and being in these really challenging environments, but learning how to do it as a group and be part of something that's bigger than yourself that really uh, made this job feel appealing. Got it. Zena, you are definitely going to be a trailblazer in your future work and even in your current work. I'm really curious about maybe some role models that you've encountered along the way. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so many role models that I have. Um, I think one of the most influential role models for me early on was actually my high school biology teacher. And my high school biology teacher, Mr. Davis, uh, was the first person to really encourage me to start pursuing my own research. I think I was waiting until I felt like I was qualified, quote unquote, you know, I thought you needed a degree in order to really be a research scientist. And he suggested that maybe I should just start contacting some uh, investigators, some scientists working nearby, even in, in my hometown. And uh, really, I think inspired me to just put myself out there and start doing research on my own, even as a high school student and then as a college student. Um, later as a college student, uh, one of my uh, now friends, Kate Harris, she was a couple years ahead of me. Um, and she, she started doing research as an undergrad in Antarctica and just trying to make her way all over the world doing this incredible uh, research. Um, and she she's remained a huge influence for me my whole life. Um, she's now an amazing writer and publishes books. And I think her ability to just capture what she's experiencing and, and sharing that with everyone um, has been really just incredibly inspiring to me for a long time. Awesome. Awesome. And yeah, I know right off the top of my head, you remind me, I actually did an intern when Catherine Sullivan was the deputy director of NOAA. And, you know, she's worked in Antarctic and obviously been a pioneer as well. So, yeah, a lot of the things you do are definitely remind me of, of you know, where she's gone <laughs> as well. Uh, so what is some advice you might give to a younger person that is trying to go to space or trying to work at NASA? Yeah, I think, you know, honestly, my advice is probably the same, whether you want to work at NASA or whatever it is that's interesting you, um, is to find mentors, find role models. Um, so a role model would be maybe someone who's not that far ahead of you, uh, but somebody whose path you really want to follow. And so you can uh, start to follow in their footsteps if they're just a couple of steps ahead of you. Uh, and then find mentors who are maybe at a later stage in their career, um, but are able to help you see a couple of next steps that you could take and really encourage you and help open doors for you. Um, so really reach out to those role models and, and mentors and don't be afraid to ask, you know, hey, can you think of any opportunities that I might be able to pursue? Um, and then the other thing is just be flexible. I think it's easy to look at somebody who is a role model to you and say, wow, you know, they they had it all figured out from the start uh, and they really followed the path um, and it was step one, two, three. But I think if you talk to any of us, um, really, it was a lot more meandering than that. So just be comfortable taking all of the unexpected turns in the road that life will throw at you. Awesome. Awesome. Now, this one's a little bit more of a futurist question. You spoke about the prospect of going to the moon, which is really exciting. Uh, what are some other advances in space exploration that you hope to see in the next 10 years? Yeah, you know, it's it's such a cool time to be working at NASA. We, My class is in a cool position. We don't actually know which vehicle we'll even be taking to space. Um, and that sounds maybe like a, a scary problem to have, but I think it's such a cool sign of the fact that we have so many options. My classmates and I might be flying on a Soyuz, we might be flying on a Dragon or a Starliner, uh, or we might be going to the moon on Orion. Um, so it's just such a cool time. 
Um, but I think what that is going to mean for us and really already is meaning for us is that space is going to open up to a lot more people. We have some of the first private astronaut missions happening right now. And, and I hope that that means that space is going to really be accessible to more and more people. I, Think about the Inspiration4 mission right now that's, you know, the first all civilian mission they'll be launching uh, just later this year, uh, definitely one to follow. And that includes, um, you know, the first person with a prosthesis to go to space. And just it's going to be awesome to see more and more people uh, getting to see this incredible view of our planet. Well, Zena, I think, like I said before, we're all inspired. We're all excited. So we can't wait to hear more about the future. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for questions, but let's not say goodbye to Zena just yet. Zena, you got time for a quick virtual selfie with us in the audience. Oh, definitely. Cool, cool. Okay, so everybody, I think we should all know how this goes, but if you don't, everybody grab your phones. I'll give you a couple seconds here to get ready. So we're going to do two virtual selfies. All right, Zena, the first one, we'll do like a, you know, just a kind of plain smile. And then the second one, we're going to get really goofy, okay? And I, I think maybe you have the opportunity to take advantage of that really cool space background, maybe, uh, you know, play off of that <laughs> as well. <laughs> All right. Awesome. So everybody should have their phones by now. Uh, so let's do a little quick countdown. Uh, the first one's a smile. Three, two, one. Okay, cool. All right, so the second one, we're going to get nice. really, really goofy here. I'm going to see, uh, I'm, I'm going to try and I'll probably just point to you and I'll give you the opportunity. I guess you're this way to me. So yeah, I'll point to you, <laughs> yeah, there you and go. Then you get the opportunity to do something really goofy. Okay, Zena, you ready? <laughs> right on. All, All right. right. Three, two, one. Floating in space here. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Zena. Really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Awesome job. I loved your presentation. And everybody, don't forget to share those selfies with us. Be sure to tag at USA Science Fest and tag me at Mr. Fascinate and at Zena Knot and use the hashtag show us how you stem. Everybody, please give Zena a virtual round of applause, a virtual high five for that awesome presentation. You can keep up with Zena on social media, like I said, at Xenonaut and head over to nasa.gov to learn more about Artemis as well as other NASA missions. Zena, like I said, an absolute pleasure meeting you today and thank you so much for joining us. Likewise, thank you so much. It was great talking with you. Before we jump into our next speaker session, let's take a few minutes for a brain break. I'm excited to introduce the incredibly talented Roy Moy III from At The STEM Music. Roy is an aerospace engineer who combines his love of music with his passion for STEM to inspire the next generation of multicultural STEM professionals. Get ready to sing and dance along because Roy is going to kill this thing. Roy, take it away. Thank you so much, Justin. Great job hosting, by the way. I am so excited about the NASA Artemis program going back to the moon. How cool is that? As an aerospace engineer myself, I remember taking space dynamics in college and learning all about how we got to the moon in the 60s and 70s. And now we get to go back. Guess what? Everybody in attendance right now, we're doing a brain break all about that with a STEM music brand new song called Back to the Moon. Check it out right now. We going back to the moon. We going back to the moon. Tell the lunar service we gon' to you soon. We got that's not to miss. You don't wanna miss this. We going back to the moon. We going back to the moon. Tell the lunar service we gon' to you soon. We got that's not to miss. You don't wanna miss this. We going back to the moon. Been a long time coming, 1972, the last time we were there. We gotta clear the air, there's still so much to discover. discover. First woman on the moon, first person of color. Gonna make great history like no other. other. Collaboration will help along the way, to help us out along the lunar stay. We going back to the moon, we going back to the moon. Tell the lunar service we gon' see you soon. We got that to hard to miss, you don't wanna miss this. We going back to the moon. We going back to the moon. Tell the 
that's a hard to miss. Better than a wish. A mission that is so crisp, you don't wanna dismiss. Got the old Ryan spacecraft soaring with the rhythm. Carried up so high by the space launch system. Oh. Gateway is the transfer over to the lunar lander. Astronauts touching down, then we hear from the commander. She gon' take a big step for women and the world on the surface of the moon. Another flag unfurled. Economic opportunity, open the doors for all of humanity, bouncing around, bouncing around, learning while in the region, stay there, gravity. Inspiration for a generation by the leading nation with a declaration for some innovation, need a celebration, going back to the, back to the, back to the, back to the moon. We going back to the moon. Tell the lunar service, we gon' see you soon. We got that so hard to miss, you don't want to miss this. We going back to the moon. Hope you enjoyed that brand new song, Back to the Moon. If you want to hear more STEM music or learn about what we do, go to our website, www.thestemmusic.com and follow us on social media at The STEM Music. I am so excited about this NASA Artemis program. Let's learn more. Back to you, Justin. Roy, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for providing your talents with that original music for this episode. Be sure to check out more of Roy's music and other resources for students at The STEM Music. If you're just tuning in, we are exploring careers that take us out of this world. I hope you're ready to meet our final speaker for the day. Dr. Mujige Cooper is a planetary protection engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. In her role, she's responsible for keeping the universe safe from Earth's contaminants and vice versa. You could call her a real life guardian of the galaxy. At JPL, Mujige has been involved in several missions, including Mars 2020, InSight, and the Mars Science Laboratory mission. Her other interests include developing sterilization capabilities that could potentially be applied to the return samples from Mars. Mujige earned a bachelor's degree in physics from Hampton University, I went to Hampton as well, and a master's and PhD in mechanical engineering. In addition to her work at NASA, Mujige is dedicated to sharing her passion for science with the public. You may see her on TV shows such as How the Universe Works and Bill Nye Saves the World. I am super excited to have Mujige here with us today. Mujige, welcome to the program. Hey, Justin. It's so great to be here today. I'm so excited to talk with you today. I heard you have an absolutely fantastic presentation for us. Yeah, I am ready to roll if you are. Let's do it. Cool. Yeah. So just to give you a little bit of background, thank you again for the amazing introduction, Justin. Um, so yeah, I'm in planetary protection. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Artemis program and then tie it into what I do. And then hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll be inspired to even be one of the first people to step foot on the surface of Mars. Who knows? It's possible. So let's start with the first picture here. And this outlines astronauts on the surface of Mars. It's an, an artist's concept of what the Artemis program will eventually look like. So Artemis is NASA's program to return astronauts to the moon by about 2024, which is meant to pave the way for the first human mission to Mars. NASA will also work with commercial partners um, to build landers, conduct tests, and just make sure that all the technologies that we hope to use on Mars are tested and deemed to be reliable. It's just like when you're going on a big camping trip, right? You might try out your tent and your camping gear and your abilities close to home or even in your backyard, just to make sure that you have the right equipment and supplies before you venture far, far away from your home and far away from civilization. Safety is NASA's top priority. So getting human missions figured out closer to home makes sense. Testing technologies and these partnerships will lead to that first human on Mars in the safest way possible. This next slide that you see here, it's a really, it's a cartoon, but it illustrates the point that 
the thing about humans is that no matter where you zoom into our bodies, whether it's on our insides or outside, you'll find a lot of microorganisms, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, E. coli, among many, many others. There are bacteria, there are more bacteria in and on our bodies than there are human cells. Uh, so before you get all freaked out about that fact, <laughs> we actually need these microbes to function and to keep, for example, our digestive health strong and fully functioning. So don't go to the bathroom and start scrubbing everything down. You need those microbes. The thing is, we need humans to build a lot of the spacecraft that are going to other planets and moons, like to Mars or Europa. And so we have to make sure we keep those germs to ourselves. And that way, if there li there's life that exists on that moon or on that planet, whether in the past or present, we'll be able to detect it without our own germs interfering with that process. It really makes it especially important to understand that, especially if we're looking for, for life, ancient life, and maybe one day present life uh, on the surface of Europa or deep in the oceans of Europa. And that kind of leads to what I do. Uh, there's a slide here that illustrates planetary protection. There are two parts to it. Planetary protection has the first part, which is to prevent forward contamination. That's when we're going to places like Mars, we have to make sure that when we send a spacecraft there, it's built in a way and cleaned in a way that we keep our germs to ourselves and we don't spread it to other places, uh, especially if there's a potential for finding life there. There's also a second slice of planetary protection, and that is one day we hope to bring samples back from Mars and beyond. And so when we bring those samples back, we have to make sure it's done in a way that protects our own biosphere, our own life here on this planet, uh, from anything that might be harmful from the places that we're exploring. So those, that's the kind of two-part uh, flavor to planetary protection. And that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you can see another slide we have here that illustrates the Mars 2020 rover, Perseverance. Perseverance, and this actually, this animation here, you can find this yourself, an interactive rover that's on mars.nasa.gov backslash mars 2020. You can play around and zoom in and find out all kinds of facts about every single component that you see here. Um, and one thing that you'll find out is that we have 43 tubes that we brought with us. And out of those 43 tubes, we need to have about 37 returnable samples but only about 20 will actually come back. And that's why a lot of the instruments that you see, if you look at the arm and you look at the mast, there are many instruments, in situ instruments, that look for biosignatures and mineralogy and all types of things that help us down select which samples are coming back. So a real life example of this is like when you go to the grocery store, right? The store is filled with food. You know, theoretically you can bring all the food home, but we all have budgets. So in order to figure out which food you're bringing back home, sometimes it takes negotiation with your parents or your siblings to see, well, what dinners or snacks do you wanna bring home? And scientists kind of do the same thing here on Earth. When they look for samples to bring back from Mars, we can only bring a small set home. And so we have to negotiate, and scientists have to negotiate with one another to find the best samples. And that might mean something different from a geologist to a biologist to a chemist. So it's just like going to the grocery store, except on a planetary scale. <laughs> and we, in planetary protection, we took over 16,000 samples of the spacecraft to make sure it was clean enough so that when we do take these samples and bring them back, that we can guarantee that when we find, if we find signs of life, that we have the highest confidence that that originated from Mars. There's another picture that I have for you here that shows what Mars, well, actually all the landing sites first, the landing sites on Mars. And these are all the places that we landed a rover uh, or a lander. So you see Viking, Pathfinder, Opportunity. Um, and there's also a place on there called Jezero Crater. And that's where we landed Perseverance. And the reason why we chose that site is if you click to the next image, this is what it looked like three and a half to four billion years ago it looked like a lake. You can see there are streams that are flowing water in and out of the lake. 
And if you go to your backyard and find your nearest lake, it's quite familiar looking. Uh, if you were to look for life here on earth, I would say go to a lake or go to a river because it's teeming. It has the highest quantity and diversity of microbial life there. So that's why we wanted to select a place like Jezero Crater. The only thing is, if you go to the next image, this is what it looks like today. So it's not teeming with water. That's what we thought it looked like three and a half to four billion years ago. But right now it's dried up. But fortunately, there are such things as fossils. Like with dinosaurs, microbes can make fossils as well. And you can see the structure in the middle of the screen. It looks like a delta. So if you're familiar with um, the Mississippi River, those big deltas that you see that structure, that's where you have a lot of sediments and where you could possibly find a lot of life that fossilized itself in those features. And so we're really excited to go to this location and see if we can find and detect signs of ancient Martian life. So this is not the first time that the rover has been on Mars. If you can see, it, I have this really cool animation of the EDL entry, descent, and landing cameras. There were seven cameras that captured the landing on Mars. There were, there were some that were facing up to see the parachute deploy. There were some facing down that saw the umbilical cord lower the, Mar the Mars rover to the surface. And so this system has been so exciting. And even though this is not the first time, we stand on the shoulders of our predecessors that told us that there is a habitable environment on Mars and that there could, there's a place that life could have possibly exist, existed. So now is the time to search for those signs of life. So this is so cool that this the system, this camera system was able to capture that for the very first time. Um, and there's just so much more work to be done on the surface with the rover collecting the samples. I have a, a little cute little animation of the rover looking back to the helicopter. Um, this environment is so familiar looking. If you look at the Atacama Desert or Death Valley, I mean, this is so familiar looking, but there's still so much more to explore on Mars. It's very cold. What is the environment like? What does the wind look like? What does it sound like? Um, and so there's just so much more to see and do. Um, the helicopter itself in this picture has already logged 12 successful flights. So it's already met its goal and more, it exceeded it. Uh, so I'm looking forward to what it's going to be doing in the near future. And this work would not be possible without a team. And I actually have a picture taken a few years ago of a team from JPL, of a lot of the women uh, in our group. And it's amazing how this, no one person can say, I did, uh, I landed a rover on the surface of Mars. It takes a village. And it, this would not be possible without a team from a diverse, from diverse series of backgrounds, whether it be you know, mechanical engineers, scientists from diverse schools, um, you know, Justin and I going to Hampton, right? There, there are many schools that come to the table uh, to make this happen and diverse cultural backgrounds. There's so much that we all shared. Um, even as we were working hard, deployed at the Cape, we shared even food and information from our cultural backgrounds that made us feel closer together. And that really, it, it enlightened one another about who each person is. And so we all unite together to make such a special thing possible. And this is really only the beginning. This mission is just the first leg of a sample return mission. So I have a, a little diagram that explains that Mars 2020, if you see on the left side of the screen of the Perseverance mission, is just the first leg. We're going to be sending so many more uh, spacecrafts of landers, fetch rovers, uh, a Mars Ascent vehicle to bring those samples back. And so there are so many more steps to come that this is just the beginning. We're just one step closer to bringing the samples back, understanding if they're used to be life on, on Mars. And also with between this and the Artemis mission, it sets the stage up for that future human presence. And who knows, one of you listening today could be the first person to step foot on Mars. So the next time you think about exploring other planets or moons, whether it be Mars or the ocean worlds of Europa and beyond, keep planetary protection in mind and remember to explore responsibly. Thank you.
Mujige, wow. <laughs> that was fantastic. I experienced every emotion. You inspired me. You got me sad about <laughs> the fossils that might have passed away millions of years ago on Mars. So much went into that. Wow. I'm super excited to learn more and take a little bit of a deeper dive here on your journey. So uh, one of the most important questions, I think, as you've dedicated your life, at least in the past few years, to space exploration is why do you think it's important to explore space in the first place? Yeah, I love that question because there's definitely uh, skeptics out there to say, why, why are we sending so much money in space? And it's not like there are people loading up cannons of money and shooting, out, shooting it out into outer space, right? This goes to the people on Earth. People are building these spacecraft. People are, are programming the rovers, writing the code. And so this really builds up our ability to advance technology in ways that may have direct benefits immediately or down the road. The biggest benefactors to the space program are humans on Earth. So that's why I think it's important to explore other places because we learn a lot about what can exist beyond our planet, beyond our planet, and we learn more about what we can do here to make this environment better, to be better humans and take care of our planet. Yeah, awesome. I, one of the cool things that I've heard as a uh, something as a Google search that you all can make at home is like some of the NASA things that were invented as a result of us trying to figure out how to get to space, like things like LASIK eye surgery and, and many more things uh, owe themselves yeah. to that innovation. So really cool. Stuff. Cell phone cameras, the, the social media as we know it today and social justice even it is impacted by our ability to have a camera in our hands. And that all stems from NASA technology. Wow. So many of the folks that are listening today, Mujige, are middle and high school students. They're, I'm sure, pumped up by your presentation. Do you have any advice for them if they want to be an engineer at NASA? Yeah, one of the things that I tell everybody, no, it doesn't matter if you're in middle school, high school, or if you are a career pro professional, uh, a C-suite executive, I say the exact same thing. My number one bit of advice is to surround yourself with people that you trust and have your best interest at heart. It may be your parents, you may have best friends, it may be a teacher, a someone in your community that will, you can go to because there will be times ahead where, you know, especially if you're trying to be an, a scientist or an engineer, it's a hard road. It's a road that you can achieve, a goal you can achieve, but it's going to be difficult. So you need that support group around you. And you know, people that'll tell you, you know what, forget those people, you can do it. Or, hey, this might be an overreaction, let's pump the brakes. So you need that person to, that you can trust to really help bounce things off of and, and really help, help support you throughout the journey. Right, right, no, it definitely makes a lot of sense. So you spoke a little bit about the fossilized remains of microorganisms that may be in the sediment. So how confident or how excited are you about the actual feasibility of finding life forms in space uh, through research like, like research going on with Perseverance? Yeah, I'm so excited about that possible you know, one day in the future because we're just starting to collect samples now. I am so excited to hear, wow, we found it. We found a biosignature. And keep in mind with the instruments that we brought on Perseverance, we cannot definitively say we found life on Mars, but you can set up all of the right pieces like biomolecules, these molecules that only living things that we know of for life that we know of have. So that signature, you can find it, but it doesn't definitively mean you found life, but man, it answers a decent chunk of the, that question. And so that's why we have to bring the samples back to the earth because we have much more sensitive equipment to look at it and really be 100% sure that what we found really did originate from a living thing. But yeah, I'm got excited. It, got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I, can, I can tell. It radiates off the screen. <laughs> so you know, one of the things I think you always do a great job of, Mujige, is uh, emphatically communicating about your craft and getting other people excited. So you've been on TV shows like Bill Nye Saves the World and done a lot of speaking as well. And you know, why do you think science communication is important? 
Yeah, I know I'm preaching to the choir with you because you do such an amazing job as well. And I just love how you are able to reach using so many mediums, uh, the, the kids, the adults, everybody in between. And I feel that it's so important because, you know, at first I was targeting middle school, elementary school and high school students, undergrads as well. But then I realized, you know, there are people that are adults that also want to be inspired. They, I've met someone that after they, they heard my lecture, they actually changed careers, which is a lot of pressure. <laughs> but I think it's important to communicate to the world what we do and why it's important. Because number one, a lot of the NASA, all of the NASA work is taxpayer funded. So everybody in the United States should understand what we're doing and why. And, and not only that, what we do is inspiring. It's exciting. And so why not spread the love of, of what we're doing? Um, I, I love to joke that the only contagion that I agree with is spreading the love of STEM and STEAM. <laughs> so that's, that's just my passion. And I think it's my duty. It's my job to do that. Well, I believe your energy surely is infectious, Mujige. And I've been inspired <laughs> myself. I'm sure the rest of us at home are inspired too. So thank you so much. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for questions. But please join me in giving Mujige a virtual high five and a round of applause. <laughs> and make sure that you follow Mujige at Mujige to keep up. That's at M-O-O-G-E-G-A to keep up with her upcoming missions and other projects. Mujige, as always, I had so much fun speaking with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Justin. It's been a pleasure. And thank you all for listening out there. I'd like to again thank our generous partners at AstraZeneca, Discovery Channel, and the U.S. Space Force for supporting this XSTEM All Access program. I hope you've enjoyed today's program. If you missed any episodes, don't forget that the entire series will be available on demand at no cost. Visit usasciencefestival.org for more. Mark your calendars for our next event the SciFest Virtual Expo in October. At SciFest, you'll virtually experience exhibit booths featuring hands-on interactive STEM content from hundreds of organizations. Catch superstar performances on the STEM stage, hunt for clues in the scavenger hunt, take selfies in the photo booth, earn points to win prizes, and so much more. SciFest is a free event, so don't forget to register at usasciencefestival.org. I'll definitely be there. Folks, it's been an absolute blast over the past four days learning alongside you all from astronauts and inventors and young people that are changing the world. And that's what XSTEM is all about, inspiring the future generation of STEM leaders just like you all. I can't wait to see you all at the next XSTEM. See you soon. <laughs>